It's gonna be a movie. This is
a few simple practices can dramatically reduce the amount of fertilizer pollution that we see um, and improve soil health. So using things like cover crops, decreasing fertilizer use overall, diversifying crops, and managing manure more responsibly can have a huge impact. We're seeing farmers start to adopt these practices for their benefits for soil health and the decrease in fertilizer costs. And if we get large companies like Tyson on board to commit to these practices, we can see changes across the entire meat industry. So this is why we've been working hard over the past three months to spread awareness about this issue and empower Des Moines area residents to call upon Tyson to make a commitment to decreasing water pollution and their supply chain. We have collected more than 1,000 petitions from all of you, um, which is really exciting. We hit that goal last night. Um, and we also had more than 120 folks in the area make calls into Tyson's headquarters asking them to clean up this water pollution. We've seen this story told on the TV, in newspapers, and on the radio. We have formed a coalition of 35 local businesses and organizations that have helped us to call up on Tyson to take this action. Um, some of our partners in that are the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, Urban Ambassadors, Iowa Citizens Action Network, and dozens of local businesses like our favorite spray gun and hot restaurant, and then four local farms as well. So we are asking Tyson to make a time-bound commitment to use more sustainable practices throughout their supply chain. Conventional practices of industrial-scale agriculture are bad for Iowa's environment and for our community's health. But there is, of course, a more sustainable path forward and that is why we're all here tonight, to learn about and talk about that. So first we'll hear from each of these speakers. I'm going to introduce them quickly with some bio, strong bios, and then they're going to introduce themselves, their perspective, their background, what they're bringing to this panel. Then I'm going to ask one or two prepared questions, and then we will open it up to audience questions. But thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, and I will go right ahead into introducing our first speaker, Bill Still. He is the general manager and CEO of Des Moines Waterworks. He has worked with Waterworks since 2012 and plays a lead role in managing the water for many of us here in the Des Moines mm -hmm. area. Bill worked for the city of Des Moines for over a decade as assistant manager for Public Works and engineering before joining Waterworks. So please welcome Bill tonight. Good evening, everybody. Wow, can you hear me back there? All right, I'll try to be noisy but brief. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming out on that kind of inclement night uh, in a holiday week. So obviously you have an interest in uh, this issue of both clean water and clean food. You know, I'm honored to be on the panel tonight. There are some true subject matter experts on a breadth of issues involving agriculture. Um, meat production. I'm going to talk just very briefly about water for a few seconds and then I'll turn the mic right back over. Uh, first and foremost, uh, my business is to work with about 250 people here in Des Moines to provide safe, affordable, abundant drinking water for 500,000 of us here in the metro area, four counties, Polk, Madison, uh, Warren, and Dallas. A uh, few exceptions in those four counties, but basically we provide water for folks in each of those four counties. So that's our basic job. Three kind of principles that I think will be helpful for you to at least put into context my remarks. Uh, first, water. Uh, it's a basic human right. Uh, we believe that we're in the public health business. I can give up cupcakes. I can give a beer, now it's a little bit more challenging for me. I certainly can give up the two of them together most of the time. Uh, I can go on a gluten-free diet, I can go on a sugar-free diet, I can go on a fat-free diet. I cannot, you cannot go on a water-free diet. It is fundamental to our survival. So first and foremost, we're in the public health business. Second, we are surface water providers. If you're like me, grew up in a small town, uh, in Iowa or maybe on a farm, you're drawing from well water from groundwater, right? And that's not what we do in Des Moines. We get our water either directly or a little indirectly from the Des Moines Raccoon Rivers. When you do that, and this gets to the third point, public health, surface water providers, 
surface water quality is driven by land activities in the watershed. And I'm sure you all get the basic principle of the watershed. The big watershed we're part of is the Mississippi, right? Here, about where we're standing, we're at the intersection of both the Raccoon and the Des Moines watersheds, where they meet over here in Principal Park. But the land activities upstream from us in the Des Moines and Raccoon rivers are industrial ag. And industrial ag brings a certain risk, a public health risk and an economic risk to us downstream. All of you are familiar with Gulf hypoxia, right? The idea that all this over-nutrification reaches my former home in New Orleans and kills off marine life in the Gulf. Well, go look at the raccoon and go look at the Des Moines. Don't drink it directly. Um, and you'll get a pretty direct sense also that there are problems with over-nutrification here and what happens in our rivers. It's serious and it's persistent. To give you an example of how persistent it is, we have talked a lot about nitrate pollution. Well, this year we can talk about blue-green algae and cyanobacteria and cyanotoxins. The, the Des Moines River is so dirty right now with this cyanotoxin, this product of blue-green algae, that we've been unable, unable to draw water from it for about the last two months. We're relying exclusively on the Raccoon River. That's a huge issue, and it's because of industrial A, because of uh, too much nitrogen, too much phosphorus in particular in surface waters. You're going to hear more, again, from this distinguished panel about land use and what its contribution is to our surface water quality in the state. But this is a serious issue. We're fortunate enough to be able to have the resources here in central Iowa to be able to deal with it up to a point. But at some point, there'll be a tipping point where we lose the public health protection that you have come to depend on. And right now, even with the public health protection and our treatment capabilities as they are, you're paying a lot more to drink water in central Iowa than you should be. There's an economic and a social justice impact to that. Enough for me for now. I'm sure I'll be back. Thanks again for being here. approach, which is to go straight to 
the largest industrial agriculture um, businesses in the country that is setting the stage for what farmers are doing and what farmers find possible. Um, it's nice for a change, you know, that we are not pointing the finger directly at farmers, although there's um, sometimes a need for that. There are a lot of reasons why people farm the way they do, and uh, we want uh, the council to make it more possible and to encourage more farmers to be able to farm more sustainably. And if we have big companies like Tyson that can incorporate uh, more sustainable feedstock into their rations, um, which would not necessarily even cost them very much, but it would provide much of a greater market for those crops and allow farmers to diversify, um, and it would be beneficial for our soil health, for our water quality, for our wildlife, um, and it would also be good for the health of the Iowans. Uh, one of the things I want to mention is that I did research last year on the nitrates and health, public health issue. And we were really surprised to find uh, much more even concerns than we expected. There had been a lot of talk at meetings that we would go to saying maybe we should raise the drinking water standard from uh, 10 parts per million to you know, maybe 20 or 30 um, because really is it even a concern? And so we thought, well, we're not sure what the answer to that is, so we better look into it. And um, we found out that there are a lot of reasons not to raise the drinking water standard. In fact, maybe we need to lower the drinking water standard from 10 parts per million to more like five parts per million, especially not just to protect us from you know, cancers over time, and there are some cancers associated with drinking nitrate, high levels of nitrates for a long period of time. But for those of you who are at the reproductive age in this room, you would be especially concerned, and I hope that you might. Uh, I also brought some copies of our, uh, the short version of our report, and you can get the long version free to download on the Iowa Environmental Council website. But uh, there are a number of birth defects that are associated with drinking nitrates during that um, important developmental time in pregnancy, just even for a short period of time, including cleft palate and some neural tube defects that can be very serious. So uh, we really need to not be, we're not talking about just protecting the drinking water for the people in Des Moines. We're talking about people all over the state who are in communities that are struggling to provide safe drinking water and maybe don't have the resources that Bill Stowe has here in Des Moines. Um, and people who are drinking from private wells, like my family in Missouri, um, who drank from a public well all the time I was growing up, and so that's probably one of my problems. But um, <laughs> anyway, that's, I think, what I'll say for now. And uh, thank you for your interest, and I look forward to your questions.
current system. And so we're not gonna, we can't just go out there. And if you think about it simply in terms of farmers, you know, almost half of our farmers now are over age 60, 30% are over age 70, and they've devoted their whole lives to putting the current system together, which they didn't intend to pay the kinds of water problems that we have, but it was part of it. And so we can't go to them now that they're, they're in the 60s and 70s and tell them they've got to change. The change is not going to come because we're, because people like me are going to tell us that we have to make the changes. They're going to change because the current system isn't functioning anymore. And uh, there are a number of farmers that are in fact understanding that. And uh, I brought my copy of a new book by David Montgomery with me called Growing a Revolution. And this is a book about farmers who are already making these changes simply because the current system doesn't work for them anymore economically. They're losing money because their costs keep going up, their returns keep going down, and so they can't do this anymore. And then they're finding that when they make some changes, all of which basically bring life back to soil, and then the soil is what sustains them, and so they start to dramatically reduce their costs, increase their net income, and now are no longer interested in getting bigger. All they're interested in is finding more ways to make the current system work better. And if you think about this simply in terms of Iowa, you know, at the Leopold Center, we started to do research on cover crops 10 years ago. And when we did, I can't tell you how many people came to us and said, why are you spending so, many, so much of your limited resources on a crop that no farmer's ever gonna grow? No farmer's ever gonna grow a crop that can't harvest. Uh, and, and, you know, that seemed like probably, the, the, you know, they, had to, they, make, they were making a point about that. But now, just in the last three years, 600,000 acres in Iowa have cover crops included. Why? Because the farmers are seeing that when they include cover crops, that begins to restore the health in the soil, and then they can start to reduce their inputs and therefore reduce their costs. So this is the early beginnings of this kind of new direction. And we're also starting to see this same kind of direction come out, again, a small, a small part of it, but coming from our healthcare professionals. Because some of our healthcare professionals are now beginning to understand that you can't solve our healthcare problems simply by putting people on some kind of pharmaceutical. That what really restores their health is when they begin to eat food that's grown on healthy soil, and then it sustains their own health. And um, Daphne Miller is one of these. She's a healthcare professional in California. Uh, she's now written a book entitled Pharmacology, spelled F-A-R-M, not P-H-A-R-M. And her whole point is that she has now discovered that when she puts her patients on whole food from healthy soil, their health starts to get restored. And so it's, it's the early beginnings, but we're seeing these things. So these are the kinds of systems changes uh, that's going to come, and then I think what all of us uh, here at the table are involved in now are beginnings that help us understand that there is another way that we can do this, so that as the current system doesn't work anymore, there will be examples out there of uh, the new way to do it, and uh, that, and, and, and if it makes us healthier, uh, you know, so much the better.
sort of agricultural impacts on water quality as we think about the usual suspects, the nutrients. Um, we also try to shed a lot of light on the faint effects of chemicals that we use in, say, crop production, the pesticides, we think about the antibiotics, the pharmaceuticals, and hormones that we use in meat production. We think about trying to tie occurrence to, to effects in the environment, to public health effects, and then linking those hopefully to sort of policy actions, which is what motivated my time in D.C. on the Hill. So um, I will mention briefly uh, that I did just take over uh, as the director at the University of Iowa of the Center of Health Effects of Environmental Contamination. Uh, there's been a lot of great work with private wells, with the arsenic contamination. Um, I, I think you'll see that we're going to have a real strong focus going forward um, to really make sure that, that center is working with, with the folks in Iowa to, to understand what's in their, their drinking water, to understand the exposures they might be getting, and hopefully giving opportunities to sort of improve quality and everything. So, I look forward to your questions tonight. Um, thanks again for having us. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, David. And last but certainly not least, we have Neil Hamilton, director of Drake's Agricultural Law Center. He is a lawyer and agricultural economics writer and also a former chairman of the Agricultural Law Section of the Association of American Law Schools. He's also a past president of the American Agricultural Law Association and has authored books and articles on agricultural and environmental law. So let's welcome him. Thank you, Elise, for inviting me. I want to commend you and uh, my dear for the work that you did and this uh, interesting uh, idea that you brought uh, forward. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all this group. Uh, they're all friends and folks I've worked with for many years. I've uh, been the director of the Agricultural Law Center at Drake for 35 years now, teaching uh, agricultural law and uh, related classes, kind of working at the intersection of uh, uh, where law fits with agriculture, uh, with a lot of focus on uh, natural resource issues, soil conservation, land tenure, uh, operation of our uh, conservation programs. And uh, in, uh, spent 21 years on the, on the advisory board of the Leopold Center and over 25 years now with the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation, working with Iowans that are out there uh, uh, doing the right thing on the land. Uh, in uh, recent years, uh, we've spent a lot of time looking at water quality, and also we've uh, done a study on private conservation initiatives, uh, which is uh, kind of a fancy way of talking about the type of uh, supply chain sustainability initiatives that uh, companies have been involved with. And, uh, trying to look under the hood and see what's really there. And so that's why uh, when I read the story about uh, Mighty Earth and, and this study, I was intrigued uh, because uh, certainly their idea of the pollution-free feed uh, is, uh, I think, a, an innovative addition to our discussion about water quality uh, in the state. It's a, a classic example of uh, an effort that tries to uh, harness consumers' interest in better food uh, or at least uh, uh, to uh, harness uh, companies' uh, efforts to market food to consumers that uh, is uh, better, and uh, then using that to, to potentially uh, help us deal with our water quality issues in the state. Uh, I gave a talk a couple months ago uh, uh, called uh, uh, High Hopes Meet Hard Truths, uh, uh, confronting the reality of uh, the water quality situation in Iowa. And uh, it's on our website at the Agricultural Law Center. And uh, I think, as many of you know, this is an issue that we have uh, been confronting for a number of years. And uh, our progress is uh, somewhat minimal. And there are any number of uh, real challenges that we face. Uh, and I think there are a number of uh, hard truths that we have to face. And uh, this panel is going to help us think a little bit about uh, some of those. So thank you uh, for being here and look forward to the questions. Audience questions. Um, so this first one is just um, 
kind of bringing up a different issue as well around industrial ag, but a report released last week by researchers at the University of Wisconsin discussed the impact that cropland conversion has on climate change due to the release of carbon from converted soils and natural vegetation. Um, and so what environmental and public health impacts of industrial agriculture are you most concerned about? And we'll just go down the panel, I think, unless someone is antsy to speak first. Like those guys. <laughs> no. You know, um, Fred did a great job of, of introducing the systems concept to this discussion, and I think that's really important for us to focus on some of the assumptions we as Iowans have about our life in Iowa and the consequences and benefits of living in a state that's been dominated by industrial agriculture. Among other things, we assume that our surface water quality, my generation in particular, has assumed that the surface water quality that we experience as islands um, is acceptable in this state. That what we're seeing on our rivers, lakes, and streams with uh, green and blue goo as the weather warms up, and even when the weather is not warm, going down and looking at the waters of the sur of surface waters of our state and thinking it looks more like cappuccino than it is like good water or good beer um, is the price we pay for living in a state that has the great stability and uh, social benefits, if you will, sociological benefits. See, Mike, I put it in a sentence. Uh, Thank you. Uh, in the state of Iowa, go to Wisconsin, go to Minnesota, go to California, all states with extraordinary agricultural economies and they have not given up, as we have, to what I say is kind of the sacrifice state thought process that we as Iowans have bought into the concept that our system of agricultural success means that our environment should be compromised. As we look at things like no-till agriculture, as we look at important movements in our society, uh, particularly here in Iowa, on organic farming, on CSA, on local foods, uh, those are great opportunities for us as Iowans to support a culture and a system that really goes against the grain of the idea that industrial agriculture means environmental uh, degradation. Well, since I would focus maybe um, more on water, I think I'm going to pass it along and then I'll take a stronger voice for the next question. Well, uh, again, I think that uh, uh, what we're talking about now is, again, a clear indication of the need for changing systems. Uh, because, you know, no one intended our current system to create the kind of water problems that we have now. But when you look at how the, what the effects of the system are, uh, you know, our soils now, because of the way we've been farming for the last hundred years, our soils now will only absorb a half inch of rainwater an hour. And so when you have three or four inches of rain and your soil's only absorbing half inch of rainwater, what's going to happen to the rest of it? The rest of it's going to run off into the streams and, 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 and contaminate our water quality. Uh, so, you know, we have to start thinking about uh, this. And this is where, you know, again, uh, some of the examples in David Montgomery's book, uh, one of them is uh, Gabe Brown, who's a farmer up in North Dakota, and he's been using this alternative system now, which he's doing because it benefits economically, it's costing him less, and therefore increasing his net profits. But he has, he has a system now where he does no-till, he includes cover crops in his system, and has in dramatically increased the diversity of his operation. He's, instead of just growing two or three crops now, he's grown seven or eight crops, and has some livestock integrated in the system. And he's been doing this now for 13 years, and his soil is now absorbing eight inches of rainwater an hour. And so, you know, these are the kinds of things that we have to look at and how, and, and again, we can't just say to farmers that they should make these kinds of changes. 
We have to also, I mean, for Gabe Brown to do this, he's been able to develop markets for the diversity of crops that he grows. But if every farmer in North Dakota did that, where would where would they sell the where would they sell their crops? So we have to also think about how we eat. Uh, and if we're only going to eat uh, food, processed food that's made from one or two crops, like corn and soybeans, then that's what farmers are going to grow. Uh, and, and you know, we don't even grow corn and soybeans mostly for food. We grow them for ethanol, we grow them for animal feed, etc. But we have to really think about how we change the whole system and how we do this together. And uh, that's part of the reason that I think it's important for us to have these conversations like we're having tonight. So, so long it's up a bit. Um, I'm a, a chemist by training, um, and I remain um, overwhelmed by the amount of chemicals that we use um, and our ability to keep up with what is being used in practice. And so we've made a pretty good research program at the University of Iowa by simply finding something that nobody knows anything about that is used heavily in animal agriculture or, or uh, crop production, and thinking about its fate and effects in the environment. And I could go on and on and on uh, with the list of things that we look at, chemicals called regulate that are used in pork production that is used to regulate mating, um, a variety of other things. But, but what I show my students all in my classes, uh, particularly those that aren't from Iowa, that the USDA puts out pesticide application maps every year. And you can always identify where Iowa is because we are the deepest color on that map for the use that we are applying. Um, and so a lot of the fate and effect studies that were needed to get these regulatory approval to use these pesticides were done under assumptions that are nowhere near the using application rates we're using today. Some of the chemicals are regulated in drinking water, others aren't. The regulatory system at the EPA isn't enough to keep up with the advances in the chemicals that we're using. So, you know, this is a tough question is what's our biggest concern? There are a lot of things to be concerned about, but where we try to spend some time uh, is making sure that we're not overlooking, you know, maybe some of the underappreciated um, concerns that we need to get more evidence and, and data on to figure out where the risks might be. Well, the question was uh, what uh, concerns us the most, and I guess my concern is uh, I'm a little bit of a student of history, uh, particularly on natural resource management, and, and Iowa has an incredibly rich legacy uh, of leadership in this area, whether it was Congressman uh, John Lacey or Henry Wallace, or Aldo Leopold, or Ada Hayden, or someone like Dean Arlen. And you know, what I think about is how appalled they would be at the level of degradation of our soil and water and land that we appear to be willing to tolerate. I mean, what we've done and are doing to the Iowa countryside and to uh, our rivers and streams and to the soil that you know, we love to claim that uh, we're so proud of it, and it's going to be our future, but uh, we rush it to the, uh, the river, to the beds of the reservoirs as quickly as we can. And so the part of this change is going to take a significant change, I think, of a recognition on the part of the, the general population, and of course you folks as leaders in, in those issues, is helping us change our political willpower around uh, these issues. Okay, so I'd now like to open it up for questions and comments from the audience. So if you'd like to ask a question, make a statement, or share uh, your story, um, please you can go ahead and raise your hand. But I'll take this one question right here right now. Um, but I also know that some of you who found the information about the event online may have submitted questions into our Google form. That's awesome. Those are a bunch of awesome questions that I have written up here. If the going gets slow from questions from the audience, um, but I also encourage you, if you submitted one of those questions, to stand up and ask it um, for everyone right now as well. But we will start with this one, which is, if you could recommend one thing to Tyson that they could change to improve water or food quality, what would it be? Okay, I'll take that one. <laughs> well, one thing that has been recommended to them, and that is very doable, is that if they would even, as I said earlier, and as Elise referred to, uh, you know, if they would even be willing to be a leader to change even like a portion of their feedstocks to incorporate small grains or legumes like hay, 
uh, alfalfa. Um, it would be healthier for animals. Animals wouldn't have to be fed as much antibiotics, for example. It would be healthier for us in a variety of ways, um, including that we would have less nitrates in our water supply and uh, also less antibiotics and um, pharmaceuticals coming down the waterways um, from surface runoff, but also from leaching into the underground tile system that's such a big part of our landscape. And so that is something that the Leopold Center actually um, has talked to some of the large um, uh, livestock industrial processors about. And um, so this isn't brand new. This was several years ago that Mark Rasmussen from the um, Leopold Center talked. And there was some receptiveness from the company, although not like at the top, but not necessarily from their um, um, purchasers. Uh, but because it was going to raise the cost just a little, but you know, they work on a very, a very cheap food model. So I think they need to be willing to spend just a little bit more uh, to, to do what's right for all of us uh, to benefit the farmers and producers that they work with too. Okay, um, so just maybe a tad more about that. If we could diversify our corn, and corn, our corn and soybean rotation has come to be the standard for Iowa. And I was just actually coordinating field day today on cover crops and uh, working with the practical farmers of Iowa there who showed a slide that over time, our system, uh, for almost 100 years, we've grown almost the same amount of corn, but we used to grow, and then on top of that corn, a lot more diverse crops, uh, much of it to feed livestock. Um, but now, we pretty much just feed livestock, corn, and soybeans. We've simplified the system. We've taken a lot of the management out of the system. Um, we don't have as much livestock in the livestock. Well, we have a lot of livestock, but the livestock we do is very concentrated. It's not outgrazing on the landscape um, as much as it should be or could be or was then when we didn't have nearly as many environmental problems. Um, so we need to do more to incorporate the, the more diverse crops, um, having a longer rotation, uh, having more diverse crops breaks up pest cycles, it um, allows more uptake of nutrients, it, keep, it prevents leaching, it, prevent, it helps the soil, or reduces soil erosion, so those are maybe some of the things. And so that for that little bit of extra cost they would incur to even at least have like a portion of their feedstock uh, being oats or alfalfa, for example. Um, you know, that is the sort of thing that you being here tonight and your petitions and your Facebook posts and your letters uh, can help encourage to say, I mean, that we have a role to play too, right? Um, that we want food like this. We want cleaner food. We want food that uh, we're willing to support um, farmers that want to practice better stewardship and companies that are willing to practice better stewardship. And, um, you know, it might cost a few cents more, but if you look in the big picture, it's probably really cheap compared to some of the other costs that we incur in our lifespan if we don't do this. This is one I can be really succinct on. What do Tyson's and Smithfields need to do, in my view, uh, to move us towards better systems? Um, get away from CAFOs. Uh, get away from this idea that we should take animals that should be outside and mainly treated on pastures um, and put them in uh, a concentrated or combined animal feeding operation. What a horrible way, what a horrible value for us as a community to support um, a way of life. Our small towns, uh, many of us grew up in small towns in Iowa and remember lockers and remember pastures and remember when livestock actually was treated uh, to some degree like uh, it was a pet. 
They were pets. Uh, they were fungible pets, unfortunately, for many of us who learned that uh, lesson in life as they grew older. But the idea that animal feeding operations are an economic dynamo in the state is an illusion. Uh, we're ruining our rural communities uh, and we're perpetuating a lifestyle and a way of thinking that is both inhumane and a huge degradation of our society. about the impact of neonicotinoids. I'm a beekeeper, I'm aware of all of that concern, but also I remember the IX, I'm very concerned about uh, the entire water uh, ecosystem and the, the Mecklenburg, et cetera, in the river and the impact that neonics are having on them. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and that's something we know a little bit about. Um, we were uh, at the University of Iowa as part of a group that looks at neonic tenoid occurrence in the university drinking water system, and we were able to find it, and that was not necessarily surprising, uh, just based on what we know about how the chemicals behave in the environment. Um, so a couple things. Um, many of you have heard of neonics because of the impacts on, on colony flap disorder that is suspected linked to bee decline. Um, one of the things that makes them so popular is they are very specific uh, to insects. And so I would not, um, there's no really compelling evidence that uh, occurrence uh, or exposure to them for large organisms like, like mammals, like us, is, is a problem that we have found. But it's a good uh, cautionary tale for that the chemicals that we apply end up in our water supply, uh, that they move. And, and I think one of the lessons we should learn from neonics is that they're supposed to be part of this culture of precision agriculture because we put them on <laughs> seed buildings. But we've been quick to realize that they wash away really readily off of seeds, uh, and that's how they mobilize with our water supply. Um, so is the news all good? Um, not necessarily, because one of the things we focus on is that chemicals aren't static in the environment. They break down, they degrade. And we're finding that some of the degradation problems that can form are more likely to, be, um, to have a biological effect towards mammals than, say, insects. So lose some of that specificity to the transformation. So what does it all mean? Um, one, you're able to find that activated carbon filters are really good at removing them. So if you're worried about any exposure that you're getting, um, you can use activated carbon like you might find in a Brita filter at a point of use. Um, but, but also, you know, there's, they're not regulated. We've only really begun to look for them because of how heavily we use them, the most heavily, insecticide, uh, heavily used insecticides in the world. And we're the hotbed for them here. So um, I guess I would say that the jury, um, you know, there's, there's still a lot of work to be done, but there's no reason to be worried at this stage. Um, we should be concerned and want to get more information, and we should want to collect more evidence as to what the risks are. But um, as of now, I think we're just beginning to sort of try to better understand where they're at in the environment and what those risks might be. And I should say that for, for smaller communities across the state of Iowa, there's the um, Grants to Counties program that's used to monitor uh, water quality in private wells. It looks at arsenic, it looks at coliform bacteria, it looks at nitrates. And a portion of that money this year is, is also being used to look at new nicotinoids in groundwater of private wells just to see what the levels might be. It is showing up. I've heard some of the preliminary results that they're in these wells. The USGS is working on this, as are some research at the University of Iowa. So the chemicals are there, but, but I think that it remains to be seen is are they present at a level that, that you should be worried about from a health perspective. And right now I can say all of it it says, says no, but it's a good lesson that you know, most people probably don't want those in their water supply. So we should be thinking about how to stop that from happening in the first place. Thank you very much. And I don't really work on pesticide issues now. Um, I mostly work on 
nutrient issues related to water quality. But in the past, there I have. Um, and I mean, I think they're a huge issue. For one thing, we don't know uh, as much as we, I mean, like not even close, of course, to as much as we need to about, for example, the synergistic effects of drinking a brew of many different things all at once. And uh, Carolyn Raffensperger, who uh, is related to Fred here, um, she is one of the authors of the precautionary principle, which is practiced and is held up as an important principle in Europe, and if, um, not in the United States. That you know, if we would probably be much more, um, it would be beneficial if we would prevent problems and study them and have a better sense of the implications of the chemicals that we decide to use first before we spread them in large quantities all across the countryside. Um, and so I think that that is probably a wise thing to think about. But thank you so much to the Center for Health Effects of Environmental Contamination. We have some of the best research on these issues going on in Iowa than anywhere in the country. So um, Chi has been doing this work for a long time and has a lot of um, good research to try to help people sort these things out. Do we have an audience question? Yeah. I think we can probably shout from here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question for you all. And, um, it's my understanding that some of the other states that are a little more water stressed, like California, are starting to look into more legal definitions around water and water rights and responsibilities. So I was wondering if you saw that being a national thing or if Iowa ever going that route of providing more of a legal framework for water as in terms of like ownerships and responsibilities. Do you see that happening? Well, the question dealt with the kind of the interplay between legal rights of ownership of water and yeah. apparently something to do with quality. Uh, we don't lack the water law in Iowa. I mean, our water law is fairly clear in terms of uh, the process of how it's owned, who owns it, who can use it. Uh, what may not be as clear is what kind of responsibility you have to it. Yeah. Uh, but that's not really a water, necessarily a water law question as much as an environmental question. Um, and, uh, you know, our groundwater law is fairly clear that people have the right to it. But then they also, they have a right to have it not impaired, and they have an obligation not to impair it. You know, things get a little, uh, a little murkier when it comes to surface water in terms of obligations. And, you know, that's a, in large part a function of the, uh, what I refer to as kind of the original sin, which was uh, uh, the way we treated agriculture under the Clean Water Act nationally. And you know, coming up with a non-point source, point source distinction, mm -hmm. uh, which was you know, perhaps understandable in the sense of you know, it's harder to put some type of a control system on something that wishes off the side of a hill as opposed to the end of a pipe. But it, I think it's created this kind of artificial idea in many people in agriculture's minds that they're really not touchable, that there's nothing that comes off of the land that's really regulatable from a water quality standpoint. And that was in part what made the bill and the waterworks lawsuit both, I think, so threatening and also so legally novel uh, it was the challenging some of the underlying ideas about how the Clean Water Act might apply to agriculture. And uh, even though a lot of people obviously know the case was dismissed, it's important to recognize that the legal issues weren't addressed, at least the Clean Water Act issues are still there. We have this unfortunate issue under Iowa law concerning the drainage districts essentially having no responsibility to do anything uh, with water quality. And in fact, they claim they don't even have the authority to do it if they wanted to, which I think is probably an inaccurate reading of the Iowa law and one that needs to change. If you go across the border into Minnesota, uh, the drainage districts are some of the leaders in addressing water quality issues. Uh, and there's no reason why Iowa's drainage districts couldn't also take that leadership role if in fact they were either uh, forced to uh, or saw it as one of their obligations or one of their responsibilities. And so that could be a legal change that would relate to water. It doesn't so much relate to water 
rights to use in yeah. terms of your responsibilities for if you're collecting it as they are. And I will say too, in terms of Iowa law, uh, we have some of the weakest laws when it comes to water protection and, and livestock production in particular. Um, and that's one of the reasons why livestock, we have such a growth of the livestock industry in the state, uh, including um, in concentrated animal feeding operations uh, and in processing. And that is exponentially growing right now. Um, so we really need to be looking at a new policy landscape. But that said, we're not even enforcing the laws that we have. And the Iowa Environmental Council has been very actively involved for its lifetime in trying to get us to even enforce the laws that we have, let alone develop stronger uh, laws that are more protective of all the citizens of the state. For example, right now we're trying to get the, the state to enforce laws related to anti-degradation policies related to our few outstanding Iowa waters. And um, we're just flagrantly violating those laws and letting um, big livestock producers do that um, and operate without permits, etc. And put in the earthen lagoons in a karst area next to a trout stream that the state has invested a lot of money in. Um, that's happening a lot. So let's even try to enforce the laws that we have. That would be a good start. I don't, uh, except for I have a refrigerator filter, you know, one of those that uh, has a lot of carbon in it. There are a lot of home treatments that you can use, and certainly, you know, that is up to you and your own discretion. The only advice I would give you uh, is follow the, surf, the, the service guidelines. It's kind of like having a uh, filter on your furnace that you don't change out. The filter can actually make things worse if you don't change it out and follow the recommended uh, maintenance procedure, but there are reverse osmosis systems. There are a lot of good systems out there. Ultimately, from a public health standpoint, we meet and exceed uh, the federal and state requirements so the water is safe. When there is a problem, we are required by law, as our friends in Flint reminded us, to timely tell you that there is a problem or we end up in jail, a place that I have no intention of going. <laughs> um, so ultimately, uh, a lot of it's aesthetic, good carbon filters, and David mentioned that, are great things to take out some of the chlorine-ish kind of smell and taste. They do a lot of other good things for you that are really more taste-driven. But I don't use a filter at home except for the one uh, that I, the cool water goes through in my refrigeration system, and I religiously change it out when it blinks one or two or zero, it's time for it to go. Well, he's braver than I am. After I, after I did the nitrate in drinking water health report, now I only drink reverse, almost only, drink reverse osmosis water that I get at the grocery store and the health food store. Any? I mean, we, we don't filter our water outside of what we have in our, our refrigerator, and you should change those when the, the volume limit has been exceeded, because otherwise anything that's down to it could start coming off, and that's worse. Um, one of the things I'll say, just to back up, Bill, is as far as a developed country goes, we have the most stringent water quality standards anywhere in the world, I would say. Um, and I know it's not precautionary principle based, but uh, they, they, the water providers um, that are sort of bound to the Safe Drinking Water Act do a tremendous job. It has a new virus at 99999 percent levels, and they do it every day, every minute. You, you know, so that the water that they're at the tap will need it. One of the things we have to keep in mind with chemicals in our water supply is it, it's all about how much. That there's a, you could look and find whatever you want to look for and find. Um, and the question becomes, at what levels is that a problem? And, and we hope that the regulatory system is there to tell us what the safe levels are, and that's the way we base our regulatory system here in the U.S., that there are safe exposures. Um, and by the letter of the law, that's what's being delivered here at TAP, or like Bill said, they go to jail. 
So I don't want to try to erode confidence in the public water supply. Would I like to see more stringent regulation? Sure, I think we need a few more things regulated. I think we could change some, some levels. But, um, but I think what we're getting into is a discussion of where the state of the science is at, of what the risks are. And um, right now, the, by the statutes so that we sort of hold our water providers to, you shouldn't be threatened by the drinking water. You shouldn't. If it's being delivered to your tap on a public supply, it's meeting all federal regulatory standards. Um, you're welcome to use a point of use treatment device, but I, I'm always cautious about those that bottle water because it's an equity issue. Um, they may not work. Um, bottled water is just tap water from some other place that may not be measured on the same level that the safe drinking water act requires. So you're taking a little bit of, um, you know, you're fitting your own hand if you look at some of these other approaches. So just sort of understand that the, the regulations, sure, they could be better, but for what we have, they're, they're pretty darn good. And people like Bill do a great job of making sure the water is as safe as it can be. And, and that's why he's sort of fighting for what he's fighting for on the nitro front. <laughs> Can I ask if Neil would agree with everything the gentleman just said right next to you? About the water quality standards? Yeah. yeah. Given that you were, you, you put on a day and a half event at, at Drake, and I've got a man with that thick of everything that was presented yeah. there, so. You mean the Safe Drinking Water Conference? Yeah. No, we didn't put that on, it was at Drake. The, the University of Iowa organized, and the Public Health Force organized the Safe Drinking Water Conference. We were the host, uh, but, and it was a great conference. But, I, but David was involved in putting it together. I don't think that he would necessarily have uh, changed his uh, view based on what was said there. I think his point was that there may well be a number of standards that might need to be lowered. But uh, you know, I, I don't worry as much about what we might be drinking as why it is uh, we can't put people into the rivers and streams to actually recreate and enjoy the water. Uh, those are where the real impairments are in our state. Uh, I mean, it's not that the drinking water is not an issue, but that's the one place where we do have a significant legal regime with someone that has a legal responsibility to meet it. And that's uh, you know what the water works are doing. And I think the, uh, the frustration they had that led them into the lawsuit uh, wishing there was someone else that would at least think about sharing some of the responsibility. Um. Yeah. So um, there's been conversation about sort of the legal, we're living in very much an era of deregulation and um, going back and not funding DNR and not even enforcing the laws that we have. It seems like a lot of the discussion seems to be that there needs to be these massive changes, not just, you know, that there's little things we can do to try to slow it down, and things people can do here, but we need legislation. We need massive change about how things work. And so going back to uh, what Bill said at the beginning about we're not able to draw water from the Des Moines River right, right now, and my sort of layman's understanding of this is that it's been progressively getting worse over time. So we'll probably get it back here and there, but it's probably going to be more and more what happens when we hit calamity? What happens when we lose the raccoon as well, or you know something happens that our water simply is no longer safe to drink? You know how do we capitalize on that with our legislatures to say, hey, you've pushed this so long, we have to fix this now. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, that's a, a compound question with a lot of different pieces to it, but let me, let me take a swing at it. Um, ultimately, regulation can only go so far. Both David and Neil have said that there's, or implied that there's a lag effect in science. Right now, again, we're very concerned about something called cyanobacteria and cyanotoxin. It's unregulated. The reason it's unregulated is because there's not enough peer-reviewed science, particularly in the public health community, to point to precise standards that we, as a provider, uh, need to follow. But our uh, experience indicates, in our discussion with people like Toledo, Ohio, that have had their water system shut down uh, because of a similar problem, has us looking at it. One of the reasons that uh, privatizing water systems doesn't make a lot of sense. If I was paid on the basis of uh, profit and reducing costs, we wouldn't be looking at cyanobacteria. We would kind of close our eyes and try to make it past the storm, and you would take the risk. 
the basic issue of how in an anti-regulatory environment we move forward with public health standards and with an ethic of greater environmental protection is a challenge. I mean, the EPA is rolling back huge amounts of protection. They're important to you not only in water, but in air quality. Uh, you know, it's extraordinary for somebody with my gray hair uh, to watch that process happen because it is, it is truly revolutionary. Uh, DNR, again, uh, makes no pretense of not following the regulations that are already on the books and are finding hundreds, thousands of CAFOs they didn't know existed uh, in Iowa. We live in a world where regulation is viewed as horrible. I live in a world that says that uh, public health demands regulation because the idea, the idea that we as individual actors will always do in the aggregate what's best for our society is ridiculous. Uh, tragedy of the commons, tragedy of the unregulated commons, the idea that we shouldn't regulate public health issues, social issues is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, the Ten Commandments and a lot of other things remind <laughs> us that we need structure. Uh, in the public health world, in the world of science, it gets more complicated. Ultimately, and you kind of foreshadowed in your question also, there'll be an incident like a Flint or like a Toledo that'll happen closer to home that will trigger um, a huge outcry. What we want to do and what I want you to do is to be in front of that cusp, be in front of that curve, be in front of that wave with these kind of discussions and reminding the legislature, reminding people at the city council level, people at the county board of supervisor level, people at the legislative level, and people at certainly at the congressional level um, that public health issues and regulation are not a bad thing when it comes to protecting us. They're a necessary thing. We're going to have to roll that back in small pieces and make that point on a regular basis. We live in an environment that is pushing back on regulation. Um, I think we're all beginning to see the consequences from some of the decisions that were made in 2016 uh, at the federal level. And certainly, any of us who watched the legislature, and Mike alluded to it, were appalled by the things that happened at the legislature, and I think there is a significant uh, support for pushing back on a lot of those issues. I don't know about you, but I didn't know fireworks was such an important issue <laughs> some of my legislators told me that. Um, there are a number of issues that are, that are out there that are missed priorities. Ultimately, you're gonna have to catch up on it, but regulation is not a bad term and a bad concept when it comes to protecting your public health from the people who you're closest to. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I, I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to regulations, and I, you know, maybe the term regulation is something we should rethink because uh, everybody thinks about regulation. You're just telling me what I have to do uh, instead of understanding it as a part of how our system works. Uh, but I also think that uh, you know, getting back to uh, the, the issue of how we bring about these kinds of changes. And, and I look at this, you know, as a farmer myself, uh, from the point of view of farmers, you know. Uh, the kind of farming system that we have in place now, which has caused all these problems, has basically been in place for about 100 years. And when we moved forward with this system, we told farmers they had to get bigger, get out, they had to farm fence row to fence row, and that's exactly what they did. And they made huge investments in buying land and buying the equipment to do all of this. And then nobody really thought about the unintended consequences, especially with regard to what this was going to do to water, back when we told farmers they had to do this. And then, as I said, you know, now farmers are in their 60s and 70s, and now we want them to you know, just abide by the regulations. Not that we shouldn't have the regulation, but I think we also have to understand the situation that they're in and that we're all in. And so how do we begin to redesign the system? And this is why I think some of the examples that I mentioned that David Montgomery talks about where farmers themselves are beginning to understand that the current system doesn't work for them economically because as the inputs that they're using, like fossil fuels and rock phosphate and 
and, 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 and irrigation water. All of these costs are going up at the same time that most of the prices are going down. We reached, most of our farm commodities reached their peak price in 2012, and they've been going down ever since. And so what are, what are farmers supposed to do? How can we begin to work with them and say, hey, look, there is another way. Uh, and, and it's a way that can actually improve your, your economic situation. You can reduce your costs, improve your net income, as farmers in David Grammy's book have pointed out, that, that's happening to them. And that's one of the things I think that is one of the reasons that even in Iowa now, we now have 600,000 acres where farmers are including cover crops, not because they were told to do that with regulation, but they began to discover from other farmers that when they include those kinds of cover crops, it improves the quality of their soil so that it increases their production and reduces their costs. And, um, and, and I, really, I realize full well that we need to make these changes faster than just 600,000 acres in three years. Uh, and, it, and it's gonna be more than just cover crops with these other things as well. But I think when we address farmers, it's important for us to understand the situation that they're in, to empathize with that, and to work with them in terms of the fact that there are other ways. There's also one of the other things that, again, uh, research that the Leopold Center funded uh, in these strips projects, and Lisa Schulte Moore being uh, one of the faculty members that's been primarily involved with this. And you know, when, when she first came up with this idea of putting about 10% of, like say, a 200-acre cornfield, put 10% into prairie strips, into prairie, you know, for the edge effect and where the water, where the water flows through, et cetera. And I thought, what farmers ever gonna do that? You know, they're supposed to farm fence row to fence row. Uh, but then began to discover the edge effect from that, and that while they lose 10% of the corn acres, they're also increasing their yields on the edges of those, and, and also you know, developing pollinators and other kind of benefits for the farm. And so it's still in the very early stages, and there aren't, it's not a huge adoption thing, but it's surprising that there is as much publicity about this now uh, even among farm groups, uh, that, that this is something that we should begin to consider. So I think we have to really look at these kinds of systems change and put those models out there so that farmers can see that there is another way, especially as they increasingly begin to understand that the current system is not working for them economically. It's not so much about the data not being available so people can't agree on what the data sets. Um, you can understand why there's disagreements because there's vested interests on both sides. But don't underestimate the power of, of that type of change happening locally. I mean, there was a comment about uh, sort of local elected officials. But New Jersey just did a, an interesting thing. They have a really bad uh, problem with performance compounds. And so the state of New Jersey said it's an unenforceable standard that's the government, the federal government has, and non states can. And the states can regulate whatever level they want. That just has to be at least as great as the federal level. So don't think that you know, if you want cleaner water, you can hold your politicians accountable to it locally. And some states will move on and, and try to address the problem when there is. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just add that the council is working more than we have, I think, more actively on the idea of basic standards of care. That we need to have some basic. Um, you could call them rules, regulations, um, that can be flexible and that uh, can you know, be maybe con connected to a soil and water conservation plan that can be tailored to different farm situations, soil types, um, how close um, that field is to a waterway, whether it's pattern tiled or not. But that we need some basic rules of the road as like a, especially as this agriculture becomes more industrialized because we are, we celebrate our industrial agriculture, but we want to treat it like it's the family farm that I grew up on where my family had a diverse, you know, diverse rotation, cattle, strong stewardship ethic that was tied to our connection to our church. 
um, and faith community to our neighbors. Um, and now agriculture, you know, in a lot of cases is not functioning that way. And um, it really doesn't make sense for a, 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 a best um, interest in the long run to be treating companies and ag businesses like a family farm that they want to be considered like a family farm but don't um, necessarily want to act that way. Well, at least let me uh, try to tie some of this stuff back to what uh, Mighty Earth and, and what you were doing uh, with your report because uh, I think we've got a perfect example of part of the challenge that we face and, and perhaps the opportunity that uh, your proposal deals with. You know, one of the responses that uh, the state of Ohio adopted after the uh, crisis in Toledo, which was largely driven by uh, excess nutrients coming in from farmland on the west end of Lake Erie, uh, was to adopt a, uh, a system of uh, mandatory nutrient application education, basically requiring people to apply uh, fertilizers to receive training, to be certified, uh, to uh, move towards developing nutrient management plans. And of course, uh, in Iowa, unfortunately, we're uh, uh, kind of frozen into an anti-regulatory dogma uh, that's uh, reflected certainly by the Farm Bureau and by leaders like uh, Secretary Northey and, and the governor. The whole nutrient management strategy is premised on the idea that there's no role for regulation. Everything is going to be entirely voluntary, uh, which is certainly one of the most significant uh, uh, flaws that are at least problems with the foundation upon which that's based. Uh, and so on this issue of nutrient management plans, it certainly is an idea that uh, the state uh, could adopt. Uh, many farmers, in fact, do. Uh, many don't. Uh, you know, there's certainly a fair number of operations that apply uh, manure in the state that don't take any credit for it when they're making their fertilizer uh, decisions uh, because there isn't particularly a good way to measure its value or it's not stored as a uniform product. But this is where uh, I think uh, it's important to think about uh, what Mike Yerth was recommending in the report. Uh, because uh, if you actually read it, uh, and I think many people in agriculture who dismissed it uh, as uh, right, the kind of propaganda from an anti meat organization, as uh, uh, you were called, uh, and uh, which I don't think is necessarily the case. But if you look at the solutions that they're proposing, uh, in terms of how a Tyson could develop a pollution-free feeding system uh, would be to, for example, require farmers to have nutrient management plans, right? And to use best management practices when it comes to applying uh, nutrients. And so this is one of the uh, areas in which uh, private conservation initiatives or sustainability systems like this uh, could in fact either uh, replace or move further ahead from regulation because uh, uh, if the person I'm selling my grain to uh, asks to see my nutrient management plan and otherwise won't buy it from me, I'm going to develop a nutrient management plan. Uh, and uh, it may look like a regulation, but of course it's happening in the private marketplace. And uh, so that's why you know, there are many people in agriculture uh, that uh, are you know, placing a lot of uh, kind of faith and optimism in these initiatives. But I think they may also be overlooking the fact that uh, the, the, uh, for them to work, in fact, uh, the companies through their protocols may in fact require people to do a lot of things that they resisted uh, if they came in the form of a regulation. But uh, coming uh, through the marketplace, and of course this is where uh, you know, consumer food dollars and people looking for better food can in fact have an influence over that. <laughs> yeah, we'll take one last question and then we will wrap up. Question for Fred on the organic farming. I know that with government assistance for like doing the cover crops and CRP, and is there any government assistance given to organic farms for, for doing organic farming or, or not? I know most people that do it are doing it not for getting government breaks, but I, I was just curious if there are any government incentives for farmers to be organic farmers. Uh, 
there are there's a small amount of like you, you don't you don't get money simply for being organic, but uh, for making the transition, there are there's a, there are not a lot of money, but there's there are some things that are available. Uh, uh, I uh, I, th I think though one of the things that uh, and, and, and I don't I don't see organic as being the solution to everything. Uh, a lot of it depends on how you do organic. I mean, it's not just one kind of organic. And ultimately, for me, uh, the core of everything that we've been talking about tonight uh, comes down to how we manage our soil. And it's really uh, the micro. You know, we we still think about soil primarily as material to hold a plant in place as some of our soil scientists even defined soil in you know, as recently as 10 years ago. Soil is actually a living community of microbes. There are more microbes in a tablespoonful of soil than there are humans on the planet. And it's when we feed those microbes in the soil in an appropriate way, then they bring about the kind of benefits from the food that comes from that which then feed the microbes in our gut. And that's why, that's why some of the healthcare professionals are starting to be beginning to see that this is part of, you know, we're now, we also look at, you know, when, we, when we look at this simply from an economic perspective, the current system of industrial agriculture increasingly is not working for farmers because their costs keep going up and their returns keep going down. It's also not working in our healthcare system. We're now spending 18% of GDP just on healthcare in this country. And you can't continue down that path. Uh, so that we have to start thinking about how do we change the system so that the, the system works. And, and this is where I think that we're still in the early stages of, of recognizing this and moving this direction. But if we start with healthy soil, the healthy soil will then enable farmers uh, to farm without all of the inputs, and this is what the, again, the farmers in uh, David Van Army point uh, pointing out, uh, those farmers now are, use almost no pesticides, uh, no fertilizers, everything that they use on the farm comes from the farm. It's that, and again, this is not a new concept. Sir Robert Howard talked about this, you know, back in the 1940s, which he referred to it as the law of return. Everything that you use on the farm should come from the farm. And so it's that recycling kind of system. And so we basically have the information, we know how to do this. The problem is that we have created a system that's an input intensive system, and we assume that those inputs are always going to be there, and they're always going to be cheap, and they're not, and that, uh, that the, the uh, effects of those inputs are not going to be you know, uh, a problem, that we can somehow regulate it well enough so that uh, so it's not going to be a problem. We have to change the system. And it's that change of the system, uh, which is grounded in restoring the health of soil and using systems on our farms that do that, and that farmers can get the benefit from that, economic benefits from that, as well as the ecological benefits. Now, I'm not saying that all those kinds of changes can happen in the next two or three years, but as the costs keep going up, uh, and farmers can't continue to do that, there's going to be more and more farmers starting to adopt it. And I think that we need to include in this, we also, you know, one other thing that we just, uh, I know we're running out of time here, but uh, I brought with me a publication on National Farmers Union uh, does an annual report on parity crisis for farmers. In other words, they raised the question, if farmers were paid on a return to investment in labor, a percentage on a percentage basis that was similar to what the rest of the food system gets from its investment in, on, on uh, uh, labor and, and, uh, and labor and investment, what would farmers be paid? And their most recent report came out in October of 2017. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, and, and, and in October of 2017, the current price that farmers were getting for wheat was $4.65 a bushel. If farmers were paid on a parity price, in other words, their return on investment in labor would be similar to the rest of the food system, they would be paid $17.70 a bushel. Uh, and in cattle, uh, in the current price in October of 2017 was $105 a hundred weight. 
if they were paid on a parity price, it would be three hundred and twenty one dollars a hundred weights. Now if you start to think about this, and I, and I know you know immediately when they start to see, well, we're gonna pay farmers that much that our food costs are that way up and we can't afford the food anymore. Well, you know, not necessarily, because if you look at it in terms of uh, a parity approach in the economic system so that farmers are participating in the same way that the cost of other parts of the system or the return and the profits of other parts of the system would need to come in balance with where the farmers are. The other thing is that if farmers were paid on a parity basis, then we wouldn't be paying all of the tax dollars for subsidizing the current system because farmers wouldn't be able to stay in business if it weren't for the subsidies. So, you know, these are, I think these are some of the kinds of system changes that we need to think about. So it isn't just that, and again, I'm not at all opposed to regulations and to pointing out that the problems that we have uh, are, you know, not only uh, ruining our water, but all kinds of other uh, ecological and natural uh, uh, costs uh, that we can't continue to, uh, you know, impose on nature into the future. So we need to have a regulatory system that points that out but if we think that we're going to solve the problems with these regulations, I think that's uh, that's probably not going to happen because uh, because the system that farmers get caught in, given you know the return that they get on investment in labor and all these other things, uh, you know they're going to continue to struggle and fight uh, to, to 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 simply stay in business as long as they can.